Hi! This video will give you an overview of characters and classes in Loot Locker, and how to set them up in your game. I am Johannes, and this is Learn with Loot Locker. Character classes let you easily create different player character types, like a thief, mage, warrior or priest for example. You can then add a default equipment to these characters called a loadout, as well as the types of assets they can use or equip. So a warrior could have a sword by default and only be able to equip plate armor. Whereas a mage would come with a staff and a robe, but wouldn't be able to use the warrior's weapon or armor. Character classes are endlessly customizable. For example, each character can have their own inventory of items or you could share inventory across all of them. And you can have just one character class or lots of them, it's completely up to you and what your game needs. Not all games have characters of course, but if you want your players to be able to equip items or you're planning on having default loadouts of any kind, you'll need to create at least one character class. To follow along in this video, I recommend that you watch our assets video before continuing, since an understanding of assets, context and complexities is needed to grasp the concept of characters and classes. A link to that video is available in the video description. Alright, we'll now go through the process of setting up a character and class in Loot Locker and assign what context it can equip and after that we will look at how this can be implemented in a small game example that I've made. To be able to create the character in Loot Locker, you need to have a class. If your game just has one type of character, then you just need to create one class. Classes are used to filter what assets a character can use and equip, so a class does not need to be standard classes like Wizard, Warrior or Archer for example. They could be used for saying that a character belongs to a certain faction, to only let that character be able to equip items with that faction's colors for example. You can view classes as a way of filtering differences between characters in your game. I will go through the process of creating a new character class called Thief in this example. We will start off by navigating to settings and then character classes. As you can see here, I already have a few classes set up, an archer, a wizard and a warrior. All of them have different contexts available and we can say if we want any assets to be added as part of the class default loadout by clicking on any of the add assets button on the different classes. A class can also have its own key values, this can be used to store base stats for example, or as I've done here, a color for every class. Now we're going to create a new thief class, so we click add character class and give the class name thief. We'll add a color as a key value to the new class, since this is needed in my implementation. Now we have created our thief class, but it currently can't equip anything, since no contexts have the thief class available. So we head to the context tab by clicking settings and then contexts. Here we will create a new context for our thief class that we will call thief weapons. We will use the generic complexity for this item and then we click save contexts. Now we are presented with some checkboxes. First we have a checkbox named detachable. This decides if the item can be removed if the player has equipped it. If you for example want your place to choose something permanent in your game, like a faction or an emblem, you can disable this. Here we can see the complexity that we chose for our context and change it if we want. Next we have checkboxes for our available character classes. Here we will check the thief class box to make this available to our thief. Then we have user facing. You can have this enabled to make assets of this context be available for integration with other platforms such as Steam for example. And last we have Depends On. This can be used for saying that you can only use this context if you have gotten a specific reward for example. Ok, now we have a class and a context, but we don't have any assets that the thief can use, so let's create a new asset for that. We navigate to the Contents tab and then select Assets. Now we'll create a new asset for a thief, we'll name it Thief Dagger and give it the context Thief Weapons. In my implementation I'm not using any specific data for my asset, it's just used to store the asset in the player's inventory in Loot Locker, so we don't need to do any additional changes on the asset other than activating it. Now everything that we need for our character class is set up in Loot Locker, so let's head into Unity and see how this could be used in a game. 
This example lets you create a new character or choose an existing one, and then equip and unequip assets, get rewards from loot boxes and trigger a time-based booster. For this video, we'll focus on the process of creating a new character or loading a previous one and showing how to equip and unequip something on that character. We'll go through the other features of this project in another video. In this example, I'm using guest login for simplicity's sake, but this would work with any other type of authentication as well. There are links in the video description on our other types of authentications. I will also not go that much into detail in this video on the implementation in Unity and focus more on the loot locker functionality. If you want to take a closer look at the implementation in Unity, the full source code of the project is available in the video description. Alright, let's dive into the code. This is the player manager script. This script handles everything around our player, such as the character, class and name. First we have using statements, the only important one for loot locker's sake here is the lootlocker.requests. Then we have a few images, which is what I'm using to make the transitions for when you're creating a character. This player manager is a static instance, this is for making the calls between the inventory manager, which we'll get to in a bit, easier to handle when we change scenes. Next we have a list of character slots. This character slot is just a simple game object that is used to store the information about a created character. Then we have some variables that are used when creating a new character. The class ID, which is what the class the new character will use, the name of the character and an input field for the name of the character. Next we have a list of strings called equipable context, which is used to filter what context the character can equip. I'm using this to show a message in the inventory if the player cannot equip an item, but the item would still not be equipped by the player on the server anyway, so this is just to make sure that we don't do any unnecessary calls to the server unless we have to. And last we have the class color, which is the color that we get from the different character classes key values that we added. When the game is started, the first thing we do is start a guest session. I will not go into detail on the guest session here, but there is a link in the video description if you want to learn more about guest authentication. If everything went correct, we continue by yielding generate character slots routine. This core routine will call get character loadout. Character loadout returns all the characters that a user has created. This information is then used to generate the information for the character slots. If a character was found, the character slot will get a bool saying that it has a character. When all this is done, the mask for the loading screen is removed and the player is now presented with the three character slots which has information about their previously created characters if they had any. On the buttons on the character selection screen, this click function is called. If it has a character, it will load that character, and if it does not, it will start to create a new character. We'll start off by looking at how a new character is created, and then we'll look into loading an existing character. The starting of creating a character first removes the mask for this canvas, and presents the player with the different classes that it can choose. Clicking these buttons will call the function select character class, which takes an int, which we can specify on the button. I will add a new button here for our thief class, we just duplicate this button here, and then we put in the ID of our new thief class, which we can see by using list character types to get the available classes from Loot Locker. Character IDs between stage and live are different in Loot Locker, so if you want to make sure that your character classes work for both stage and live, it's best to get the information directly from Loot Locker. When this is clicked, we remove this canvas mask and are presented with the next step in our character creation process. Here we will add a name for our character. I'm naming this character Sneaky Steve, since it's a thief. And then we click the button Create Character. This is where it will actually start to create the character. Now we're executing the Loot Locker SDK Manager .create character function, which will take in the character class ID, the name of the character, and if it should be the default character. The default bool is handy since you can use that to set this character as the default character for this player, so if you want, you can use it to always load the previous character, for example. When this is done, we start the load character routine. This is the same routine that will be called if the player already has an existing character, since we by then have a character ID to put in. We first set this character as the default character in case that we loaded the character. If it was a new character, we already have it set to default, but we will still run this function since we want to get the color of our class that we added in the loot locker dashboard. Next we get the context that this character can equip, so we execute a call to loot locker SDK manager, get equipable context to default character. This returns the context that this character can equip and we will add this to a list. 
and we will later use this to show a message to the player if they try to equip an asset that has the wrong context for this specific character. When all of this is done, the main scene is loaded asynchronously in the background. This is so that we can load the character's equipment while the game is still running. After the main scene has been loaded, we change the color of the stickman to match the color of what we got from the server with a simple vertex color change. When all of this is done, we will load the character's equipment from the inventory manager scripts function handle equipment routine. To get the equipment that a character has, we run the get current loadout to default character. This will get us a list of the equipped items on the character. I'm using a scriptable object to store the information about the assets, and depending on how you do your implementation, you could use strings or prefabs for this. Or you could also store everything about an asset on LootLocker and generate all of them dynamically if you want. The inventory item scriptable object is just a data container that stores information about the item, where it will be equipped on the player and what icon to use in the inventory. When we equip the item, we must first check if a similar item already is equipped, and in that case unequip that item first. And we do this by checking against a list of equipped items that gets populated when an item gets equipped. If the information from LootLocker and the scriptable object match, a new item will be generated and be put under the correct parent transform. Now our character has been loaded, all equipment is visually available, so now we remove the canvas mask to present this to the player. Now the player manager has done its part, and it just sits around until any other function is called on it. We will now look at getting the player's inventory and equipping and unequipping an asset. When we open the inventory, the function getPlayerInventory is called. This runs the lootlocker function getInventory, which will get the current player's inventory. In this example, all characters have a shared inventory, but it is also possible to make each character have their own inventory by using a feature we call Heroes, which I'll go into more detail on in another video. Then we run the function update inventory, and here we send in the inventory that we got from the response from LootLocker. We do a check for a rental asset here, a topic I'll cover in another video. Next we call a function called handleItem and send in the single inventory variable that we got from this for loop. This function will generate the item and put it in the player's inventory by calling the new inventory item dot generate for inventory. Here we will set the asset instance ID of the item to the one that we got from LootLocker. The asset instance ID is the ID of this particular copy of the asset, completely unique across the entire LootLocker database. Then we use the information that we get from our item in our database and also the rarity of the item and use that to set the color of the background for the item. Then we check if the item is equipped or not. If it is equipped we will show an outline of it in the inventory and if it's not equipped we will remove the outline. Now the inventory has been generated. All of the inventory items that get generated are set up with a button that when clicked on will call the function useItem. This first checks if it's a loot box, which we'll cover in another video. If it isn't a loot box, it will try to equip the asset by calling equip asset on the inventory manager. Here we also send in information if the item is equipped or not and we do this by checking the asset instance ID against our list of equipped item. If the item isn't in that list, that means that it isn't equipped. Equip asset first checks if the item can be equipped by checking against the equipable context in our list. We'll skip the rental asset for this video and look at equip id asset to default character instead. This takes in the asset instance id, which is what we want to equip, and when this gets a successful response, we run the visually equip item function that we use when loading the character. We then also run the equip item in inventory function, which will put an outline of the object inside of the player's inventory. If the item was equipped, we want to unequip it instead. And that works more or less the same as when equipping. We just run the unequip id asset to default character, and then remove the visual object from our character and the outline from the item in the inventory. And that is all that we'll cover in this video. Characters, classes and assets are core features of LootLocker. It might look complex, but hopefully this video has shown you that it isn't. For the coming videos we will dive a bit deeper into other types of complexity, such as the rental asset and lootbox complexity. If you want to know more about assets, have any questions or just want to show off your game, 
you should join our Discord. Link is in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like and to not miss out on any new content, make sure to subscribe. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.